good kitten internet um today's vlog is going to be about making an npc for a role-playing adventure if you are one of my players and you're going to be on an adventure oh thursday that would be april uh 28th then i'd recommend just not watching this vlog it's not super spoiler happy or anything like that but there's going to be some things on here that it'd be better if you just didn't watch. Um, for the rest of you, and or the people who have no idea what I had just said, hi. Um, to give a bit of background, I run a role-playing game. Or I run two different role-playing games. And this is specifically for a Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition role-playing game that I run every other Thursday. I just noticed that there's a cat here on my camera. Hold on, let me get it off the camera lens. I don't think it was affecting image quality, but it was bothering me. And Boo Kitty just ran off. Oh. Anyway, um, so what I want to do is kind of run through my thought processes behind making an NPC. Now, this isn't a major NPC or anything like that. This is somebody who has, in fact, never appeared prior to this adventure and we're at the end of the campaign um to give you an idea as to what's been going on the party this is the dining campaign so the dining campaign is based off of the phrase tonight we dine in hell um hell in this case is actually the one of the hells i should say is actually the location for the majority of the campaign for this is a very this is effectively from a demon slash devil perspective a post-apocalyptic universe um they lost badly they even lost their well, it's not even their home world they lost the world that they were inhabiting the hells um and instead it's been what, a thousand years or so and it's downright habitable the prime material plane so to speak is running out of space because it's very small and inhabited so this is actually the party was an outcropping of a city-state that started building a city in the hells and all sorts of things have progressed blah 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 long story short there was an opposition army the army faint attacked the player's home city and in reality they're actually going after or by home city, I mean the one that they created. They're actually going after the starting city of the campaign back on the prime material plane instead. So this particular situation, this is an NPC that's in what's called the Celestial Lighthouse. And I, I'll just bring up Fast Character now. Um, this is a site, fastcharacter.com, that just makes a quick character sheet. Uh, the idea behind it is to um, it's partially cut off because I cut off the top part to zoom in a little bit more but um, the part set the top part says need a few quick pregens for a game convention or organized play group at your local game store your cousin out of from out of town wants to sit in and join this week's game you don't have time to min max your way through a character build but want to try out something new so this is just a really quick character creator and this is what I use as the framework for an NPC um, in this case we are going to be talking about uh, let me zoom in a bit. Uh, actually, that zoom's probably good to run with. And I'm pretty sure it's visible for you. So we are talking about the character Ezri Habib. So there's a running thing with this campaign setting that merchants... It started off with a merchant by the name of Habib. I was making a reference to Might and Magic 6. Um, which I believe in my Might and Magic 6 video, I even made commentary about the fact that I made the great merchant Habib into a well-known figure in my campaign setting. Uh, Habib, for reference, means either good friend or lover or beloved or something like that. It's primarily used as a masculine first name, but it can also be used as a surname. This campaign setting has actually made... Oh... Maid's not the right word, but long story short, the primary merchantary corporation, um, franchising corporation, I should say, is Habib Corp. And the Habib Corporation 
controls a vast majority of mercantilism in the campaign setting. It's to the point where I, the way I made it is kind of borrowing from church doctrine where um, the Catholic church, the reason why priests don't marry is that you're marrying the church. It's really to make sure that priests don't have children and thus could theoretically inherit church property. And I use that same tactic here. The Habib family, they're all people who have married the corporation and thus they don't have children and can't inherit their businesses. It belongs to the corporation. It belongs to, and each member of the corporation is a franchisee effectively. Ezri Habib is a merchant. Um, she operates Habib's Discount Sushi, which is a sushi shop that she recently opened up in the um, Celestial Lighthouse. I should probably explain what that is too. A lot of explanation. Um, the Celestial Lighthouse is this campaign's unique feature. It is a... For those of you that are familiar with the Planescape campaign setting from back in Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition days or the video game Planescape Torment or lots of other things, um, the Celestial Lighthouse is this campaign setting's version of Sigil. Which is to say it's a city of doors. The Celestial Lighthouse is an indoor structure of some variety that has a beacon that makes it extremely easy for people to come to the lighthouse from other planes. And it is effectively a tower. Nobody knows how tall the tower actually is. As far as anybody can tell, it's infinitely tall. And it even goes down a ways. It's, it's actually not infinite going down. The party is actually seen at the bottom. But anyway... Um, point is that there's a lot of entrances and exits to different parts of the same prime material plane, different prime, uh, different prime material planes, different non-prime material planes, elemental planes, whole nine yards. In theory, every theoretical universe, every theoretical setting has a door, at least one door, somewhere inside of the tower. That is a celestial lighthouse. Due to events in the campaign setting, the Celestial Lighthouse in the area around the main entrance to South Cormac, which is the city that, the aforementioned city that's being invaded, that is turned into a bazaar. It is a great mercantile area because it's a very quick, there's really quick passages that go from there to other parts of the Prime Material Plane. It's much faster to go through the Celestial Lighthouse than anywhere else. And hey, look, if you're already going through the Celestial light, Lighthouse, why don't you buy some wares? So the Celestial Lighthouse is effectively controlled by the Habib Corporation. They own the vast majority of stalls, shops, restaurants, in this case. You get the idea. All of this is backstory for reference. The only thing that I had in my mind when I started making Esri was she's a shopkeeper. Uh, she, her pronouns. Name of Esri. Because she's a shopkeep, family name of Habib. I decided that she was an orc while I was taking a shower this evening. And that's about it. So I'm going to use the fast creator to generate one. Um, so she's, an, for reference, in my campaign setting, orcs use the stacks of half orcs in the book. There aren't really too many in the way of mixed species people. So half orcs, half dragons, half elves, they don't really exist all that often. And when they do, they're mules effectively. So they're not particularly common. You don't really have half elven communities or anything like that to speak of. That also means they tend to be very discriminated against, but that's not where I'm going with this. What I'm going is the fact that orcs tend to be a very discriminated species in D&D settings, and this one is specifically going against that grain. So, Ezri is an orc um, woman, and she is a merchant, which means that she's going to have a relatively high charisma stat. That much I know. Um, I decided to pick Warlock as base class, just because, well, probably the one that makes the most sense for 
a charisma based character who's not super casty. So artificers are int based, barbarians are usually strength based, really con based. Bards are a possibility. Um, clerics, not so much, although could be a cleric. Um, druids, no, that doesn't really fit for a random merchant. Although it'd be kind of funny to have a druid cleric of something water-based, like Circle of the Coastal or something like that, and that's how she's getting her fish. Uh, um, <laughs> fighter, nah, that doesn't make much sense. Fighters are usually dex or strength-based anyway. Um, monk, no, doesn't make sense. There's too many monks in the campaign setting as it is. I have two monk players in the group. Paladin, I already have a member of the Habib Corporation who's a paladin, so I don't want to double up on that. Um, Ranger, haha, <laughs> Ranger. Um, Rogue, I don't want her to be sneaky or anything like that. Um, she's probably going to actually have relatively low decks, in fact. So, no. Uh, Sorcerer is a possibility. I don't know if I want her to be super casty, though, which is the reason why I kind of landed on Warlock. I mean, really, she doesn't really need a class, except for the fact that I need to explain how she survived, and we'll get to that in a bit. So, at least for right now, I'm going to have her be a Warlock of the Patron, the Arcfey. So, a little bit of chaos. Uh, for a frame of reference, South Cormac, in the old style of D&D, where you would have... Like, for instance, the elemental plane of, or not elemental plane, the positive energy plane has an extremely strong, good aligned nature. South Cormac, the city, has an extremely strong, chaotic nature. Um, the mayor of South Cormac is a succubus. They do not care. Um, it is extremely chaotic bent. So, it kind of makes sense. Let's go with some chaos. Um... She's going to be level 3. I decided that by rolling a d20. And I rolled a 3. So she's level 3. Uh, she's a guild merchant for a background. Because that's what she is. She is a merchant of a guild. It's just that they're set up as a corporation rather than as a guild. Um, so, guild merchant. She's not an artisan in this case. Didn't quite make sense. In my mind. She's, she's preparing sushi. You could be an artisan, I suppose, but I'm going to go with Guild Merchant. And then Alignment, I'm going to go with Random, but she's not evil. She could be neutral, that's fine, but she's not evil. So we need some personality traits. This is one of the reasons why I like using fast characters. It lets me think about these things. So she is going to be extremely stubborn. That's one of the reasons why she's survived. Because this area is going to be an area that the army's already gone through. She's one of the survivors. So she's going to be... Stubborn. Second personality trait. She's going to have a wicked sense of humor. Um, the reason why I'm doing that is just because this is a relatively serious situation. And me as a DM, or any type of GM for that matter, I like to make sure that things are still at least a little bit silly. Also, I notice I'm sitting up really at all. Um, let me see if I can... There, I'll drop my chair a little bit. That helps. Um, I want things to be at least a little bit silly. So she's going to have a really wicked sense of humor. Her ideals. Now, the way the party is going to meet her is that she is going to be one of three survivors uh, that's left the plane and have dragged themselves across Acheron. Acheron being one of the hells, but technically a demiplane. In this case, it's not a full world, so it doesn't have an entire ecosystem or anything like that. It's basically a dead world. There's nothing really there. You can breathe, but it's all gray. You don't really know what time of day it is because you don't see the sun. Um, they've actually, at this point, there is actually a settlement on one side of Acheron. Uh, settlement. It's really a tavern. It's called um, Last Stop Before Hell. I know it got called something else, but I don't remember what it was. But the Last, last Stop Before Hell? Last Chance Before Hell? Anyway, um, it's a tavern that was very recently built. It's used as a waypoint to go from 
the Celestial Lighthouse to Dis, which is the plane that the party is actually on. So this is sort of a part of the party's area. They've been getting a lot of settlers that have come from South Cormac. So this is basically a pit stop along the way. So her ideal is going to be something about survivalship or friendship or making it out. So she's going to be with a NPC that the party already knows. And another NPC that the players know, but the party never really interacted with her. Um, so I think that her ideal is going to be... We're going to go with help others survive. No, help everyone survive. Her ideal is basically everyone needs to live. She is providing food. Um, most of the shops in the Celestial Lighthouse aren't food-based. They're going to be things like trading back and forth. There's weapon stands. There's potion shops. She's providing food. She is helping others survive. She's helping herself survive as well by, you know, actually having profits. Bond. So, the other NPC that the party knows that's going to be with her is a... I can't remember off the top of my head the term now. My brain is saying entertainer. That's not accurate. But it's basically a tiny beholder. Um... The party met and befriended the Beholder way, way back at the early part of the campaign. And the Beholder basically left and stayed inside of the Celestial Lighthouse. And it's been that way ever since. Uh, the Beholder got charmed or something like that. I can't remember now. So her bond is to that Beholder. Oh, well, tiny Beholder. It's not actually a Beholder. Whatever. So... Could just say floating all about her friend. Law. She's a coward. No, that doesn't make sense. Otherwise, she would just have hid instead of going to go get help. What would her flaw be? Maybe she cares too much. No, because then she would have tried to fight back. A character flaw that I am very familiar with for myself, she is easily overwhelmed. The reason why she didn't fight back wasn't because she couldn't, wasn't because she didn't want to. She just got so overwhelmed that she stopped thinking. And at this point, her only task is to get and seek out help. So we're going to go with that. Um, from here, we have a display format. Um, we want this to be a color character sheet, vertical layout. Ability stats. So I'm just going to have it use the standard roll 4 6 drop the lowest. Technically, the party is actually using a different stat line. But for an NPC that's not a particularly major NPC, I'm fine with just using standard roll. Um, feet. She's not going to have any because she's only level three. So I don't need to worry about that. Um, let's see. We're going to go with... She's a merchant, so which means she's going to have a lot more money than normal. So she's going to just go wild with money haul craziness for magic items. She's part of the reason why she's going to be one of the survivors is because she's been collecting shinies. Ooh, actually. Maybe instead of stubborn. Oh, apologies, I have a translator extension I've been trying to look up on apartments. Um, Instead of stubborn...
collector of shinies. Anyway, um, she doesn't have a custom racial lineage. Is there a random for height? Not really. Um, hmm. Let's see. There we go. Just a random Reddit thread. Orc. Orc. Six foot five to five foot seven. So five foot five plus two D six. So fun fact, you can actually tell Google to roll two D six. So five foot five plus three, so she's five foot eight. Okay. Weird thing. Um in one of my groups, uh, the other campaign that I run, almost the entire party ended up the same height, along with a lot of the NPCs. Completely random luck. Um, what about weight? 194 to 382? I might need to expand this a little bit so I can see. So, orc. Orc. 2d8 times weight modifier. So she is going to be 7 times. I rolled a 3, so 21 pounds. Plus 190, so she's 211. And yes, I am actually using pounds in this case because D&D uses imperial measurements. So... That's just what I'm going to use. Uh, all right. Let's create. And this is what I get as a result. See, it actually makes the entire character sheet. Um, those stats are terrible. Holy crap. 10. Or, sorry, her high stat is a 14 and low stat's 10. You know what, we're going to go back and I'm going to change the stat up a little bit. I can't do that. Well, what if I reroll? She'd be really dumb. I don't like that. Let's reroll once more. Nine int is a little more understandable, but eh. What are these stats? They're awful. I mean, that one's actually not too bad. Maybe I'll keep that. She's apparently proficient in Arcana, Deception, Insight, and Intimidation, and Persuasion. That actually does kind of make sense for a Warlock Merchant. Um, yeah, I think we're going to be keeping these. So she has 24 hit points. Oof. Kind of low, but... That's fine. Um, so she's chaotic. Good. Interesting. That kind of makes sense. Um, what does she have on her? She has a packed weapon of a scimitar. So she... Um, warlocks have an option as to whether they get a packed weapon, a packed book, or a packed... Familiar? like a better way of phrasing it. And I think the last one is a packed amulet of some variety because that's a newer edition. She has a packed weapon. Okay, that's cool. Um, does she have any magic items? Yes, she does. So she's attuned to an eyes of the eagle. She has a rod of security, a scroll of protection from celestials. Interesting. Huh. That might actually be pretty useful for her. Um, she doesn't know Gnomish. So in this campaign setting, specifically for South Cormac, but in general in the campaign setting, the two most common languages are common and Gnomish. So it's interesting that she knows Sylvan, which does make sense. She is a fey warlock. Feylock. 
Okay, that would make sense. Actually, I'm liking this quite a bit. Uh, is there a download button? Oh, more gear. Um, although, this is just regular gear. She's got Weaver's tools. Okay. I might just change that to be cooking supplies, but that's fine. Although, Sushi Chef, the only thing that she's cooking is rice. Huh. huh. I kind of like the whole, you know, extra stuff at the end. Fascinating. All right, so we have her character sheet at this point. I'm just going to print this off as a PDF. No, I don't want to print it. Do I want to print my actual printer? Kind of do, actually. Although I think I'm just going to instead save this to OneNote. That's right, you all can't see the top part of the screen. I keep forgetting. Apologies. Um... Ah, that really messed up. Um, yeah, why is that? Firefox, what are you doing? Print backgrounds. Maybe that's the... Nope. I'm not too concerned about anything beyond the first page anyway. So we're just going to go with... Print to OneNote... Pages, one. Print. We are going to save this. I know this part you won't be able to see, but give me just a moment. This is the dining campaign, NPCs. All right, and that actually looks fairly good. I uh, printed it out as just a screenshot, basically, which, fine, it'll work just fine. And, yeah. Okay, um, for purposes of sharing things with you, I will print this out as a PDF. It's starting to get a little late. Save to PDF. Just one page. Sure. Hmm, that's weird. One moment. You know, we're just going to use the web page, and I scrolled it up a bit where everything's visible. So, um, we have the actual stats for... I keep forgetting where I'm married. For Esri here. So, as I'd mentioned, I, as I was talking, I started coming up with more things. Like... Why does she have Sylvan as a language? Well, it's because she has a pact with a Arkfey. Um, why does she have <clears throat> a scroll of protection from Celestials? <clears throat> What's interesting is that in this particular situation, Celestials and Demon slash Devils have the had their alignments kind of swapped. It's not quite accurate, but close in this case. That scroll of protection from Celestials would have actually been extremely handy for her getting out. So it might have been that she actually had two scrolls and used up one. Um, some potions of healing. That's useful. I don't know where the Drift Globe is, though. Let me quickly Google that. Drift Globe. Small sphere of thick glass. So it casts light or daylight. So it's effectively a torch, but better. Fancy torch. Okay. Seems simple enough. I don't need to re-roll the 2d8. Um, okay. She's not a very good fighter. I don't know why she has a backed weapon, but, you know, whatever. Um, she is not very observant. Interesting. Naturally, she has all charisma skills plus arcana, so she does know about magic. That might explain how she got to where she was going. Although, at this point, it's pretty easy to get to unity. Hmm. Anyway, 
Um, maybe her arc fay actually gave her f warning in advance about what was about to happen. That could make sense. That might be why she has those scrolls of protection from celestials on her. So it's not the type of thing that you'd be walking around with, right? So, oh, apparently it randomized her height anyway. Nah, that's fine. I was wondering why it was in the custom section. This is perfectly okay. She's 18 years old. Okay. So even for an orc that's still relatively young, she's a, oh, that's right. That's just a standard orchestra. Trait. Um, which these actually get replaced. I probably should have replaced that with half orc just because that's the stats we're using, but it really doesn't matter. Um, what else about her? So she apparently focuses on Eldritch Blast. Yep. Although she has True Strike as a cantrip. Oh, that's one of the worst spells in D&D. &D, in fifth ed. Um, she has Charm Person, Crown of Madness, Hex, and Witch Bolt. It's interesting. Hmm. Anyway, um, she doesn't have a whole bunch of money on her at the moment. So it's probably just whatever she had on her pocket when she ran. Um, because... She should have a lot more money on her. I mean, that's what? 13. forty three gold pieces worth, roughly. Um, no, sorry. Uh, 43.7 gold pieces worth. That's not a whole bunch of money for a level three merchant, a uh, Habib at that. Habibs are generally filthy rich in this case. Or maybe not filthy rich. They present themselves as though they're filthy rich. They're paying off a lot of loans back to the Beep Corp in order to be able to afford their fancy entrepreneurial ships. Um, and franchising fees. Okay. I think we made an NPC been roughly a half an hour so hope you've enjoyed this internet i have a kitty at my feet um i'll talk to you next time and i'll include the a little bit of the first clip of this that way we have a kitty in the video too it's it's a requirement you know me i'll talk to you next time internet bye Ooh, i actually forgot um one of the things that i'm trying to do when it comes to role-playing characters is to find a voice for them. So I think Ezri is going to be the type of voice that, so she has, she's an orc. And even though orcs are treated much better than they are in a stereotypical D&D setting, there's still a lot of discrimination associated with them. It just happens to be that where orcs primarily live, which is the Morkin Sands, um, orcs were named after the Sands, the Sands were not named after orcs. Um, well, sort of. Anyway, um, they're not that far away from where South Cormac is, distance-wise, like, where their primary home is. So there's a very good chance Ezri was actually born in South Cormac, uh, which would make sense, given that Ezri's a Habib. And the Morkin Sands, they don't have as much, since they're primarily nomadic, they don't really have as much in the way of need for a stationary merchant. Also... South Cormac is a coastal city. You don't usually find a sushi shop anywhere but coastal cities in a medieval... Well, to be fair, the world is not medieval. The world is actually pre-industrial age at this point, and certain parts of it are actually starting to hit an industrial age. But anyway, um, point is that you're going to probably be in a coastal place or at the very least, a place with a river in order to be able to have fresh fish for said sushi. So I'm going to guess that Ezri is actually from South Cormac. And her voice. She's going to try to... So it's something that a lot of immigrant families, a first generation, would do. Which is to try to blend in as much as possible. So she's going to have a South Cormac accent. She is going to try everything that she can to make the impression that she has always been from South Cormac. Her family has always been from South Cormac, even though she is the first person of the family born in South Cormac. Given the fact that she's only 18 years old, she's got a lot to prove, 
She wants to make sure that, well, her guild membership is a very interesting thing. Because being a member of the Habib Corp, she probably has a huge debt. She wants to be able to get people to come into the place. At the same time, she wants everybody to survive. So she's probably secretly feeding people who wouldn't be able to feed themselves. Um, that's actually something in common with the other Habib, or a member of the Habib family that the players know about. And she actually has information about him. So they actually know each other. That would make sense. And they know each other because she's a mage. And Tanzane Habib, which is the other member of the Habib Corporation, is very well known for hiring a lot of apprentice mages. So it might be that Ezri actually worked for Tanzane at one point. Which means that every so often she's going to slip into speaking like the way Tanzane does. Because Tanzane does not speak like a person who's been in South Gormick forever, because he wasn't. He's actually from another material plane. Tanzain Habib here. He has a very grandiose personality. So every so often, she's going to slip and start speaking like Tanzain instead of like a, you know, like a regular person. A good chap, as it were, of South Cormac. Yeah, that works. Okay, now I'm going to bed. Bye, Internet. Good kitten internet. Meow. 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 It's late, thus Boo Kitty wants attention. And food. It's really both. Why don't you come up more on camera, Boo Kitty? <laughs>